Let us pray together. Gracious God, you give us words of truth to order our lives. We pray that this morning as we turn to them, you will silence in us any voice but your own so that we can hear not only with our ears but also with our hearts and be inspired to follow where you lead. Amen. Lee? Thank you, Lee, for sharing God's word with us this morning. Years ago, in Atlanta, Georgia, there was a comedy club called the Wits End Players. And every year about this time, and particularly in election years, they would roll out a song, the chorus of which went something like this. Now, it may seem strange and it may seem odd, but a vote for me is a vote for God, for God is an American. If you were here with us, I can imagine that you might be chuckling. The people who are here are grinning at me. It's absurd. God isn't an American. When God took on human form and came to earth, it was long before America as we know it was. God came as a Jew to occupy Palestine under Roman government and was a political refugee in Egypt by the time he was two. When I was eight, my teacher told me that we were going to say the Pledge of Allegiance with some new words. Instead of saying one nation indivisible, which was a reference to the division of the Civil War, we would begin to say one nation under God indivisible. And so that day I went home to my theological consultant, who was the post-chaplain at Fort Jackson in South Carolina at that point, and, and went a year later to become the head of the chaplain's board when they created the first open-ended films to help soldiers think about those moral decisions that we all have to make in this life and how they would respond when it came their time to make moral choices. Before all of that, even before me, he had been a chaplain in the European theater during the Second World War. He went with the troops from North Africa up through Europe all the way into Germany. He saw what happened to nations around a country that saw itself, the majority of which saw itself as the greatest nation with right to take over others and to treat people who were deemed second-class citizens any way they wanted to. He was present at the liberation of one of the camps. That was my main theological authority when I was eight. And so I went home and I said to him, so my teacher says that we're going to say one nation under God indivisible from now on. What do you think? And he said, well, it's complicated. I mean, on the one hand, to acknowledge that God's in charge is always a good thing. So yeah, that makes sense. But on the other hand, to say one nation under God may make some people think that we are the favorite nation, that we are more special to God than anybody else. And it may make some people think that we are the only nation under God, and that's just wrong. God's in charge everywhere. It was a lot for an eight-year-old to think about. It still is. This weekend, we celebrate the 244th anniversary of the founding of this nation. It's a wonderful time to think about all the privileges that we have, all the good things that there are in this great land. And I hope you've spent some time doing that this weekend. There's so much promise and potential here, so much that is good. In this season of pandemic, I think particularly about the fact that in this land, people can apply when they've been out of work 
for a long while for government assistance, and companies can apply for government assistance to pay their workers. It's a complex process, it's hard to do, there are delays, but still, both at the state level and at the federal level, money is available to help people with support until they can return to work. I read this week that in Los Angeles, the city has rented 15,000 hotel rooms for homeless people who have coronavirus or are suspected that they may have it. That's a really humanitarian thing to do. There are 150,000 homeless people in the city of Los Angeles. 10% of them probably have the virus. So it's, it's humanitarian to give them a place to be safe. It's also a good way to help control the spread of the virus. Those two are just two examples of the things that we have the capacity to do here. There are nations that can't. There are nations that are too poor in their own resources to care for the poorest among them. And so some, and in many cases many, of their citizens live in constant fear of disease and of starvation. I think that, math, that, that Jesus in Matthew's Gospel and that Paul in Romans are pointing to some things that are important to help us think about what it means to be citizens of one nation under God. They remind us that as Christian citizens, we are citizens of two kingdoms. The Pharisees in Matthew go to Jesus to trap him. They see his popularity as a threat to their own status, and they want to catch him out. It gets worse later in the gospel, as you well know, but at this point, they want to put him to the test. And so they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? It seems a simple yes or no question, but the backstory is way more complicated. A census had been taken years before, that census that sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. And on the basis of that census, the Romans determined what tribute the Jews could afford to pay the Jews in occupied Palestine. The Jews in occupied Palestine really deeply resented that tax. It was a poll tax, and they all had to pay it. And there were, from time to time, rebellions. One, led by a man named Judas of Galilee, was so powerful that the Romans really had a lot of trouble putting it down. Well, here came this Jesus, whom some were referring to as the King of the Jews, the Messiah. And the Pharisees wanted to know, are you going to make trouble are you going to be like Judas, one who will try to overthrow the Romans and, and put us all at risk? And Jesus calmly, non-reactively, answers their question and says, well, so whose picture is on the coin that we use to pay the tax? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, well, fine. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And then he added to it, and give to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? In our scripture, we told us that they went away. But they came back. They came back with another question that I think is a result of their mulling over what Jesus had said in response to the question about taxes. They came and said, Jesus, tell us, what is the great, greatest commandment in the law? And it's as though Jesus goes to the memory banks in his head and sorts through all of them. Quoting from Deuteronomy, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And quoting from Leviticus, he says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor 
as you love yourself. On these depend all of the law and the prophets. And the Pharisees went away again. What belongs to God is way more than poll tax, way more than political allegiance. It is total loyalty to God and total commitment to those with whom we share God's world. That's what Jesus is saying. He seems to suggest that loyalty to the emperor and loyalty to God are two different things. Paul in Romans puts a different spin on it. John Calvin, who was often referred to as the father of Presbyterianism and was city manager in Geneva, Switzerland, when he was writing his commentaries, says this about the question of loyalty that those who are in civil authority are put there by God, they're called by God to see to the welfare of the people, to put down wrongdoing, to keep order and public safety. God wants people to live in peace and security, and so God calls people to be leaders in society, to be civil servants seeing to the welfare of the community. Another commentator on Romans points to yet another meaning in this complicated passage. He says, so in the church in Rome, there were people who had relatives and friends back in occupied Palestine. They would know about the unrest about which the Pharisees tested Jesus, and they would have their loyalties to their homeland. To them, Paul says, don't don't create divisions in the church. Church unity, love for others, and obedience to God's instituted authority is way more important than race and homeland. For Christians in the 21st century, these words from different situations long ago, I think have profound wisdom to offer. One thing I think they tell us is that the kind of citizenship we have and the kind of leaders we elect are important. Following civil authority allows us to live with freedom and relative prosperity in this great land. It is not so everywhere. Nazi Germany is one example. It has not always been so among us. There are times like the American Revolution when patriots among us have rebelled against what seemed unjust rule. We are one nation under God. As Christian citizens in it, we are lucky people, and we have a particular responsibility to pray for God's guidance for our country and for its leaders, and to pray for wisdom for ourselves as we live as responsible citizens in public life, to enable us to work for justice and to do what we can to see to the welfare of our neighbors. But our perhaps most particular responsibility is always to remember that our first allegiance is to God's sovereign love for us and for God's world. Amen.